Good afternoon. It's so lovely to see like so many people that have turned up to this event. Um, so myself, I'm Olivia, and this is Ruby. We're part of Plastic Oceans Europe, and we're the UK country managers. So this is part of our Trees and Seas Festival. It's a 10-day event where we have the most activism and the most, um, you know, the, the largest amount of uh, cleanups and education programs. So this is sort of one of those events, and we have a discussion panel. So we're going to introduce. Oops. Hello. Oh, there we go. We have Sam Peters. He's the founder of Planted, who's um, let us use this event space. Um, we have Alex Mitten we, from Private Podcast. So he's on sustainability as well. We have Lottie, who's from UK Youth for Nature, and Lucy, who's from the Reserva Youth Foundation. So, um, so Sam Peters is an award-winning journalist, and in tw uh, 2019, he started developing his passion in sustainability and um, co-founded Planted Cities, and they're the only events and uh, media company promoting the nature-based and environmentally focused design. And so this amazing hut uh, travels everywhere with them, and it's all about sustainability. Um, and in 2014, he was shortlisted for the prestigious Cudlet Prize, um, for his uh, journalism on the long-term head risks uh, and injuries in sport. Um, with Planted Now, an established part of UK Design Fabric, Sam has this week led a series of conversations about plastic waste and regenerating nature alongside UK's leading biophilic design expert, Oliver Heath. Um, so we have Alex, who's next. So he spent nearly a decade talking nonsense on TV. But he's in more recent years decided to change the discussion towards sustainability and how we can tackle that. So he's a co-host of the podcast Private Parts with over 1.5 monthly listeners. And his hard-earned platforms on social media, he's very vocal about climate issues and he's passionate about discovering the solutions, which are some of what we're going to discuss today. Alongside this, he works as head of brand partnerships with Jukebox PR, and his focus has turned to connecting brands into m the music world. So he's keen to implement and discuss innovation and methods to make the event industry more planet friendly. Next, we have Lottie, and Lottie is a voluntary organizing member for the UK Youth for Nature, which is the UK's leading youth-led network calling on the politicians and governments of the UK to take urgent action and tackle the, le the loss of nature. Outside of her voluntary position, Lottie is also a research assistant out of the University of Southampton Sustainability Implementation Group, and she focuses on researching options for nature-based offsetting in the Solent region. And so for our last panelist today, we have Lucy Houliston, who's a National Geographic Explorer, a digital content producer, and a zoologist with a passion for weird wildlife. As a member of Reserva, the Youth Lounge Trust Youth Council and Board of Directors, she is working to empower fellow young people in biodiversity conservation and assist in the creation of a global network of youth-funded nature reserves. Lucy has delivered talks at festivals and schools internationally, chaired panel discussions and educational webinars, and hosted, produced, and directed digital events, including the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales SCOMA Live series, the Reserva and WWF's Future of Earth Hour, and she's also sloth obsessed, having spent three years working as the digital content producer of the Sloth Appreciation Society. <laughs> so welcome to our speakers. Woohoo! Thank you. Um, so we're actually going to jump straight in. This is sort of a question for uh, Sam and Lottie. Obviously, you two work in eco cities and biodiversity offsetting. And so we're wondering sort of where you see the future of it going and how we're actually implementing it as well as um, sort of the, uh, what's the word? You know, the, um, yeah, the plan and the, the realistic sort of goals that we can reach. Um, thank you, and, and 
thanks to uh, having for having me here. It's a, a great pleasure to actually be on the panel rather than hosting. So uh, good on you guys for doing this. It's a really amazing um, campaign that you guys are running. Um, the future of uh, regenerating nature in urban spaces, I think, is um, accelerating all the time. I think the understanding of what can be done in in um, urban design within urban design is is uh, growing all the time. Um, Oliver Heath, who we work with here at Planted, is uh, leading the conversation really around um, nature-based design. Um, and I think you look around a space like this, which was not so long ago a completely kind of derelict, run-down, toxic, um, and literally toxic uh, area um, where there were coal dumps out the back and uh, you know waste everywhere. Um, has been regenerated and designed very empathetically with nature in mind the, the canal behind us was unusable um, completely desertified in a way if, if a canal can be but devoid of life um, you've got the London Wildlife Trust sitting behind us Camley Street uh, Park which is just a, a wonderful haven for nature and I think what we're realizing now actually that in many ways urban spaces are havens for nature even more so than when you go into the countryside a lot of the time you see these ton of desolate uh, over farmed completely kind of again desertified um, spaces which are completely devoid of biodiversity um, because they've been completely industrial industrially farmed to within an inch of their life um, often using chemical inputs and um, you know the, so so cities in many ways are, are becoming kind of safe space for nature which is you know kind of crazy in a way but I think once the more we get our heads around that the more designers architects uh, urban planners um, government need to really realise that we've got an amazing opportunity and uh, in fact a good friend of mine Paul Desois who's sitting in the audience now once said um, he's a founder of a great company called Another Country who are enormously sustainable and, and empathetic with the way that they deal with, with wood and woodlands but he once said urban to me and it, it chimed that um, urban spaces and cities shouldn't be places that are designed for us to escape from they should be de designed for us to stay here and, and nature is a is, is a thing that people need and require in their lives for, for mental and health, re, uh, physical health reasons. So I think I'm optimistic about the future on that front. Hi, everyone. So um, I think what you said there about like regeneration is accelerating is very true. But we need to consider that when we are doing regeneration, we need to make sure that we're doing it correctly. So that when we're regenerating spaces, we're not risking the biodiversity that's already there or we're not changing the landscape in a negative way. Because sometimes when you, know, you get the ball rolling, we're seeing these regeneration projects, but they need to be done in the correct way. Otherwise, we could end up having more of a negative impact than we would have. Um, so for example, one thing I've been researching is tree planting projects. And when you're doing tree planting projects, if you're not choosing the right land in which to plant those trees, you can actually have a massive negative effect on biodiversity. But you can also cause um, a really big release of carbon emissions. So for example, if, if peat land is being used for tree planting, peat stores massive amounts of carbon and also sequesters uh, a really large amount of carbon every year. If you disturb that peatland and you're disturbing those soils, you're releasing that carbon. So you're never going to get it back despite you know, how many trees you may plant there. So it's about having an understanding of when we're regenerating these areas or we're restoring these landscapes, that we're doing it in an educated way and we're considering the environment that's already there. Um, that's really, really... really Great, so I completely understand because tree planting is also becoming a much more popular sort of way to tackle climate change, but there's obviously the ways that you have to do it correctly as well. Um, and so are there any ways that we can sort of incorporate um, all of the sustainability into our lives? Because obviously planted is all about having these sustainable pieces of furniture, the sustainable um, items such as shoes and coats and whatnot. So how can we as the public, how can we incorporate that in a way that we're doing it correctly, but also that it's easy enough for the public to change to? Because often, a, long, a lot of the time, it's too difficult to change. So what are some easy ways that we can sort of incorporate sustainability into our lives? Yeah, yeah whoever would like to answer. But, I mean, I think one thing that we've learned, certainly over the last three or four years of running Planted, is just how many 
businesses and brands and organizations are trying to do the right thing and um and also if you try and think you if you think you can change the world in you know a day is you can't um but everyone can do incremental things i think what's amazing about everyone on this panel i think clearly is that there's an activism ele element which i think we had jonathan porritt um one of the you know uk's great environmentalists who's been one of the founder members of the green party in 1971 uh, he was on the panel uh, or interviewed him a couple of days ago on here and he was saying you know there is reason to be really optimistic about the future even though we all recognize that there's massive massive problems that need to be overcome but activism challenge um your local uh, politician engage with politics don't disengage with politics recognize that we can all get involved in that front and also absolutely recognize that every pound you have in your pocket is an opportunity to affect change you know choose the businesses that are trying to do the right thing look at are they b corp certified are they um serious about sustainability or are they you know just try and pick beneath the surface of the kind of corporate veneer and try and recognize what greenwashing is it's a real thing Organizations put massive amounts of money into spinning themselves as green organizations, whereas others maybe don't talk so much about it, but are doing the right thing. You know, just think about where you spend your pound. Spend it locally if you can, um, and spend it with organizations that are really serious about protecting the environment, and there's lots out there. Well, I was going to say one thing as well, is obviously, Alex, you have your podcast, and you've invited sustainability yeah. um, experts onto that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's obviously one way you can get massively involved is sharing you know, everybody's views. So I don't know what you've, you've done on that, if you'd like to share. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off by saying um, I feel slightly underqualified to be uh, to be talking on the panel with these guys. But um, yeah, no, I was I was very lucky to be given like a, a small platform to, to be able to talk about these things. Um, and I, I guess one of the biggest barriers and one of the issues I found just personally is as soon as you start to notice these issues and speak up about them, unless you're evangelical, and you live a completely sustainable life. It's really weird. People just want to try and take you down. So there's this really odd, like, divisive culture, which I, I see across kind of every sector. And I, I, it's something that seems to be kind of conditioned into us. And so, you know, I would, I would say something about sustainability, for example, in a post, and then someone would see that I've been on holiday. And I'd end up getting into, like, you know, a two-hour argument. Um, so it's, it's kind of like trying to work out how we get rid of that, that division. Um, and, and I'm always like, you know, it's much better if you've got a million people who are making small change rather than one person who's evangelical. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's for, for me, it's like coming at it. I, I'm a bit of an idiot in this space, really. I don't know too much, but I'm just trying to learn as much as I can, uh, trying to implement that in my own life um, and, and then just discuss it with people who do know, basically. I know, Lucy, you also have, obviously, you're into digital creation and, you know, obviously, actually quite a few of you have a background in, in media and design and stuff like that. But, you know, that's one way that we can really sort of share the views of people and you can you can get a voice on platforms, especially in youth advocacy, because both Lottie and Lucy are youth advocates. So, you know, I don't know how you found that and if you could share how people can get started in it and anything. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that surprised me since I started you know, doing campaigning or, you know, taking action for biodiversity and, and conservation is people in my family and, and friends who weren't particularly interested in the natural world or the environment, environmental issues beforehand are 100% behind what I'm doing and they're sharing stuff. And, they're, and that means so much, you know, people connect with stories and they connect with personal stories. And if you've got something that you care about, you know, just... The, the power of kind of words to to say, you know, this is an issue, I care about it, I'm doing something about it. Tell that story in the, in the right way, in a personal way. You can get people who you never thought would engage with it to engage with it. And that's the power of social media and media and things like podcasts. You know, that's a, it's a personal story. And, and that's kind of what all of this is based on, right, is where we're sharing our experiences. Um, so that's what I would say. And I completely agree about the activism thing. People are, uh, they're always trying to kind of pick holes, but in the world that we live in now, we, we can't live a perfect life. There's always going to be something, you know. I'm a vegan, for example, but I, you know, still buy stuff that's flown across the world that's wrapped in plastic. You know, you can go on and say, I'm helping the planet. It, 
you just need to focus on on the positives we can't none of us can live perfect lives so all of those small steps really make a difference i think there's two brilliant points actually and then really important points one is you're absolutely right it is literally impossible to lead, lead a perfect life when it comes to uh, sustainable lifestyle sustainable living trying to protect the planet you know the the supply chains just aren't there and alex made a a good point you know and I, I feel for someone who's got a high profile who you know it's easy to to take a pop at people you know and, and anybody who claims to be living a perfect lifestyle is just they're lying it's impossible but there are some people that are trying harder than others and that's definitely for sure and they're the people we should try and link up with and I think you know just to your point about social media I completely agree as well the power is in the sto hands of the storyteller and you know when I grew up I think I'm it's probably fair to say looking around I'm probably that the older statesman on this which is um, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's where I am. I'm 44 years old, and I work for traditional media outlets. So I work for the Sunday Times. I work for the Mail on Sunday. When I was in my 20s, in my early 20s, and raging against the machine, you know, there wasn't much of an outlet there to um, to, to to tell stories. You know, if the if the national media didn't pick it up, if the traditional media didn't pick it up, it didn't get out there. And that is something that this the next generation really you guys and a lot of the people in the audience have a power that wasn't there with when I was in my 20s and that is social media and if it's used in the right way there's a massive massive force there a really powerful force to mobilize to come together to build collectives and partnerships and and and, and unify actually rather than polarize and, and that's how we should be using social media I think. We also have one thing is obviously we have our Trees and Seas Festival at the moment, which for us at Plastic Oceans is our really, it's our year opportunity to come together with different brands that work on sustainability, different people that have different views to share. And these experiences are really what makes, you know, sustainability go around and, and understand how we can get involved, you know, from doing a cleanup to, to starting at a higher level in the web of interactions and stuff. And you start buying sustainability, sustainably, you start re using, reducing, recycling, regifting, repurposing, you know, all of those things. And I'm sure you're all, you know, very familiar and, you know, we all try to live the best way we can. Um, but, yeah. So it's just how can we continue to, to foster that sustainability and using the tools that we have today to help reduce the amount of plastic we have. And like you said, it's really, it's impossible to live in a completely sustainable life. So it's all just about doing the best we can because um, one thing that we can do is connecting it to our governments and our MPs. And I know both of you are definitely very involved with that with Reserva and with uh, UK Youth for Nature. Um, so you have your letters for government and you have your um, government connecting and talking to your MPs. So. Uh, can you explain the sort of pathways that youth can take to uh, create those connections? Uh, yeah, oh, I'll start off with what Reserve is doing to kind of try and get young people's voices into, you know, the big, the big conversations that are happening at the conference of parties, deciding, you know, coming up with these biodiversity frameworks and action on climate change. Um, we've got a campaign called the One Million Letters campaign, and what that does is we're asking young people so from zero to 27 uh, to to write a letter talking about what it is they love about nature and and urging world leaders you know to protect it why they think we should protect it and we're collecting those and taking them to those conferences so you know we're putting them on the desks delivering them in person to these people in power and going back to the whole storytelling thing we're hoping that that kind of bit of emotion you know we've got drawings from 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 four-year-olds about why they love tigers um is really gonna gonna drive change and in addition to that each of the letters are matched with three dollars so um what that equates to at the moment in terms of our first uh, reserve project which we're currently working to expand uh, is that three dollars that one letter raises enough money to protect a, roughly a classroom size patch of rainforest. So the kids are always, you know, they, they listen to talks and they hear about these issues and they're like, well, what can I do? And they can just write this letter, draw a picture and have their voices heard by government, but also save habitat, threatened habitat in Ecuador. So, so um, the organization that I volunteer with is a UK based organization. And um, our aim is to persuade government 
to make better decisions to protect nature in the UK. And like, even just last year, I never would have thought of myself as a campaigner or someone who would lead campaigns or get involved with politics in this way. And I just had to take the first step. And I think the first step is finding organisations where you've got like-minded people you can work with. Um, so for me, joining UK Youth for Nature was like a really pivotal moment in, in my life because it has enabled me to campaign for things that I'm really passionate about. And I think that's one thing you need to do. You need to find something that you want to change or you want to see change or you want to make a difference and use that as your idea and then roll with it for a campaign. And you don't have to be a campaigner. You don't have to work in campaign space to make political change. You can be anyone with a normal job, living a normal life, and you just have to have kind of the drive to want to see the change. Um, I mean, you know, for example, my local MP didn't know who I was, and now he probably does because I sent him a lot of emails <laughs> about things that I'm angry about or that I want to see change. And, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to your local MP to see these changes. Don't be afraid to, you know, tweet parliamentary members. It's all about creating that voice. And if enough people are expressing their opinion and expressing their desire, the government have to listen. And I think it's really important to just to make people aware that there isn't a divide between campaigners and normal people. Everyone is a campaigner when it comes to something they're passionate about. Everyone is an activist and everyone can make change. I had a question. Um, what do you think is the best way to make them listen? Because the most frustrating thing I find is there's amazing people like yourselves all doing so much hard work. And then I just read yesterday they passed a budget that's basically going to open up all of this protected land for development and it just I'm just like what <laughs> it's just nonsensical it's like almost suicidal I don't get it so like what can we do as individuals or as a collective to kind of you know make them actually listen um, so a simple thing you can do is simply sign can get their petitions. addresses can we go and <laughs> knock yeah, on the yeah. door <laughs> yeah write letters you know you can find out you can write letters you can write emails um, you can sign petitions. Um, you know, sometimes petitions fall a bit short. They don't really get seen by the people who want to get seen. You know, as you said with social media, social media has created this massive platform. If you can make enough noise on social media, politicians have to listen. Um, so, for example, I don't know if some people are aware of the Stop Cambo campaign. So that was to stop a, an oil field off um, the coast of Scotland. And they used their mass movement on social media to ensure that Cambo was stopped, that that didn't go ahead. And if it wasn't for that social media campaign, the government would have gone ahead with it. Um, you know, it's realising that finding what's your skill, what's your niche, and how can I apply that? So, for example, you, you, you've used your platform. That's your niche. That's how, how you're helping to make change. But it might be, you know, you work in design or, or graphic design and you're good at making posters. So you can make posters for campaigns. You don't have to be in, you know, the environment space or the nature space to get involved. Everyone has their skills. They just need to have the guidance to apply it to those campaigns or apply it to the situation. Well, actually, one thing I think as well, touching on that, is that it is very difficult to know where to get started in biodiversity and, and climate change and how we can actually help tackle it, because often it's so overwhelming. There's just no place to start. And we can do, we do cleanups, you can do activism and education, but sort of your eco cities, right, Sam? One of the incredible things, Ruby and I, as we were walking here today, we saw so many bees just coming around. And obviously, these little urban havens are, are just buzzing with in, insects. And I know there's at least one insect fan in the in the panel and you know it's about you can create small changes even in your gardens and you plant native flowers I don't know how many of you you know you do that but yeah it's definitely and that's definitely something that we talk a lot about at planted is that no matter what the space that you have if you've got a windowsill you can rewild you can you know don't leave the windowsill desolate and you know, plant some lavender plant something that the pollinators like do give them the food the the life source that they need and just from little incremental stages you can you know grow bigger and bigger and you know a lot of us would have been inspired by reading Isabella Tree's book uh, Wilding which was probably where 
uh, the concept of rewilding and regenerating nature essentially rather than sort of like just drawing a line and trying to defend it which because it is constantly under attack and Alex is absolutely right to highlight this absolutely disgraceful decision to renege on the Elms um, promise which was the environmental land management scheme which was uh, one of the dare I say it, few benefits potentially of Brexit, but it's, it was you know, a, a move away from the common agricultural policy to actually subsidise farmers and big landowners rather than just for owning land to actually subsidise them for uh, enabling nature and for introducing biodiversity and all those good things which need to happen to rebalance the planet, which has got so out of kilter. But Isabella Tree's book was utterly inspiring to me, but you know, talk, when you're talking about several hectares of land that's quite hard for most of us to get our heads around and it's kind of untouchable but when you bring it down to a, a micro level rather than that macro level all of us can rewild in our own way like as i say use your window seals use any little space that you have encourage your local authorities do all the things that all the panelists have just talked about and and just engage and once you've engaged your mind a little bit you start to realize just how much is possible Actually, just yesterday, I met um, this adorable little boy and his father um, at our cleanup, and um, we were talking about sustainability, and they actually carry around this little bottle, and in that bottle, they carry sugar water, because they see bees on the ground, and uh, the little boy, he's maybe six, and he was like, everybody sees bees, and they think they're dead, so we have the sugar water to help them fly again, and it's just, it was really lovely, because he's so young, and he's already involved, and it's just incredible, just such a small thing can make a huge difference because without the little boy with the sugar water, those bees would be left on the floor. So it's just these tiny actions that are so heartwarming that we can all take part in. Um, so it's really great seeing all of these areas. And when we came to this event, um, we, we stopped by yesterday, and just seeing all the plants and the biodiversity, it's really heartwarming. And I, I know it's plants and biodiversity and nature is really good for mental health. And I know that's something that everyone here has seen and talked about. So it's, it's really lovely to have these spaces to connect. Well, there's also um, a new documentary that's just come out on Netflix called The Biggest Little Farm. I don't know if anybody's heard or seen it. I'm yet to watch it, so no spoilers, please. Um, but it focuses on rewilding and changing sort of the social aspects around it. So it's about this couple that have a farm and it's a similar story to NEP rewilding project that Isabella Tree is obviously a part of. And to how they've built new ecosystems and how they're bringing it back and they're working on finding the balance. And that's one thing that I'm sure you've had to struggle with when you're, when you're recreating any new urban spaces is just figuring out how to make that balance. But yeah, I saw that documentary, it was, it, it was amazing, so emotional. Also, it looks like a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> like, but when you, when you get it right, it just looks so rewarding. And another documentary I watched recently was uh, The Year the World Changed, I think, which was on Apple with, with David Attenborough, which looked at what the pandemic did um, over, over a year period. And it kind of followed different ecosystems and you know, parts of nature and the impact that us just stopping being annoying humans for like, you know, a small space of time, actually, you know, nature bounced back so much which kind of just made me think like we do still have you know an amazing ability to to try and turn this around we just need to slow down a little bit and kind of stop this mad neurotic lives that we live um yeah and as i touched on it before you know i think it's easy to look at kind of wastelands and uh trashed uh, urban spaces which have been so badly designed and think like nature can never come back but it's definitely evident here and I would urge anybody who hasn't been to Camley Street Garden with London Wildlife Trust behind you know as I can't stress enough for those of you who aren't old enough to remember just how grim this area was when when I was growing up it was off limits um, uh, basically but it's now just the most vibrant canal living space where nature has it's been rewilded back there and that was done in uh, about 1983 I think and it's just flourishing and nature comes back really hard if it's given a chance. Well, I was going to say, it was one thing as well, just touching on that from when the start of the pandemic happened, everybody suddenly went, oh my God, we have birds in urban areas. Like, of course we do, but you never hear them and their songs were more complicated and louder and they, it was really interesting to see that and it is truly giving nature an opportunity to bounce back, I'm sure it will. And I know Lucy would know about this on the Land Trust and how, you know, protecting it can actually make such a change, not just rewilding, but already protecting existing ecosystems. Yeah, definitely. And I think that kind of 
just stripping it back to small scale, it's, it's easy to think it's kind of humans versus nature, but I think the main problem is we have separated ourselves from nature. You know, talking about the lockdown and how wildlife bounced back, it's an interesting thing because, you know, it, it does paint the picture a little bit of, well, when we're not around, when we're not going about our lives, wildlife's fine. But the reality is we need to learn to change, to live alongside it, to live as part of it. And talking about the gardens, you know, I challenge you all to go home and just, like, forget about tidy gardens and just leave the garden to grow wild, you know, especially in spring, summertime. Because it's funny how we've got this obsession with controlling nature and everything being tidy when... You know, we look at rainforests, we see them on the TV, we see them in magazines, whatever, and we think that is incredible, it's beautiful, it's full of wildlife, and yet it's so messy, you know. Uh, it, what would you prefer, a kind of barren, tidy garden or something that's a little bit messy but full of wildlife? You know, you can have your own rainforest, your own rewilding site in, in your back garden if you are lucky enough to have a garden. And yeah, so that's, that's the challenge I set for everyone. I think that's it's another brilliant point if I dare say but there are no linear lines or very few straight lines in nature nature wants mess nature wants chaos and you know again a couple of the talks on on this stage in the last couple of days people have talked about trying to recreate a more chaotic countryside as well like you go into the countryside all the hedgerows are either torn up or they're they're controlled to within an inch of their lives like all the fields are flat and there's nothing there's nothing happening in them and I completely agree we need to kind of unpick our entrenched kind of Victorian ideal or mindset which is all about control and order and suppression it's very British it's very regimented and it's yeah. like what the empire was built on but actually it's not what the planet needs or wants and actually we by letting it go we'll all relax a little bit yeah and I think uh, so many times people have people have asked me how do we get young people engaged in nature and it's an impossible question to answer because if we knew we'd be doing it, you know, it's really tricky. But I think an important thing is kids being able to experience nature. And I think having something that's wild looking and messy, like that's an adventure to go out and explore that. And there's so much more to see. So I think it will also help connect the younger generation, the next generation with wildlife and make them care about it a bit more. Well, that's something that I was going to say, Lottie is super into for UK Youth for Nature, so... Um, yeah, so I mean, 10% of children in the UK play outside. The other 90% have never played in a wild space before, which is a shocking statistic. <laughs> I mean, even 30 years ago, it was 40% of children had played outside in a wild space, and now it's only 10. So we need to be able to create these pathways so that children have access to, to wild spaces. And I think... In an urban setting, you have even more scope to do this, um, you know, because you've got a bit of a, a blank canvas. You have spaces where you can rewild in urban areas, and people live so close to these urban areas. It's just about creating the access points, you know, having education in schools. So. Um, one of our other members at, at UK Youth for Nature has worked very hard to campaign for um, the establishment of a natural history GCSE. And this will be going into all schools in 2025, which is really important because it will provide education for all children, no matter their background, no matter where they come from, it will be in every school. But it's not just about education. In order to want to protect something, you need to have access to it. You need to have an understanding of, of that space that you want to protect. So it needs, you know, more government funding is needed to allow kids, especially in urban environments, to have access to nature. And if, if anyone wants to understand more about access to nature or the, the appalling lack of access to nature that we actually have in the UK and the lack of access that we have to... Um, green sites to, to rivers. I urge you to read Nick Hay's book, which is called The Book of Trespass, and that is a brilliant historical unpicking of how we've lost public space and how we've lost public access. And, you know, I'm a big believer in... Uh, um, Dostoevsky said, I think you can't love what you don't know. And I think, unfortunately, now our young people have been sort of... It's been this, like, creeping effect of stealing access. And we have a very distorted land ownership 
and unusual way of uh, um, controlling again people's access to nature and again that's if you want to get involved in some really important campaigns the work that Nick Hayes is doing with Guy Shrubsole around public access to nature is really worth looking at. We've also had um, almost sort of a social reset from previous generations to ours. What we find an amazing level of biodiversity is nowhere near what it used to be, right? And our parents, they tell us we go up to the countryside and we go, oh my God, you can hear all the birds. And they go, this is nothing. We used to hear whippoorwills at night and you used to hear all of the birds literally at all hours. And it's, it's just changed massively. And you have this sort of social reset and it's really difficult to try to figure out how you can almost get it back to the level that we've we've never known you know we've never experienced so George Monbiot calls it shifting baselines doesn't it so every generation just thinks it's normal what they're experiencing but actually you know you're absolutely right the and I, you know a lot of it's down to industrialized farming and a lot of it's down to the way we mismanage our land and you know that's it's just it's a really good point that you've made I also know as kids we were really really lucky we had um, this awesome garden and we had this brick footpath with a whole bunch of insects underneath and what we would do is we would pry up the bricks which was a terrible idea because then it meant any time that our parents walked over the bricks they would trip and fall because we've like kind of left the bricks all hoggly poggly but it was really great for us because it had so many insects under it and I think that was definitely how we got started into zoology is that we had that first hands-on experience and I used to bring snails and critters into the classroom and I get told off by the teachers because they're like ew gross um, but it was really exciting for us having that connection to nature I think it's really important that kids get that connection first because it helps them understand just what they're going to be protecting in the future. Well, I, and I think actually that's part of what Eco Cities can do and what Planted is about is you, you're creating new green spaces for kids to get that hands-on experience. You know, you can't appreciate it if you haven't ha got to hold a spider in your hand. And so many people are, you know, oh, spiders are unclean or you don't want them in your house. And, you know, if you bring these green spaces back into urban areas, you create urban forests, the results would be, you know, amazing. I'm sure you've seen with your your company. So, yeah, definitely. And I mean that disconnect. I think one of the guys on the on the panel made the the, the comment about how we've disconnected from nature, and that's something planted. We talk about reconnecting people and spaces with nature, and uh, you know, it's it's happened again over a, per a extended period of time, and. That shifting baseline has changed all the time. Um, about we don't really realise how far apart we've come and uh, and how removed we are from from nature on a day to day basis. So yeah, find ways to engage children and 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 encourage architects and designers to design spaces which are empathetic to nature. It's you know biophilic design is a really interesting concept, and um, I think when we met Oliver Heath for the first time. Um, you know, I'd, I'd had um, some a, di a difficult period of my, of my life. We'd had a, a, a tragedy within our family, which caused me a huge amount of um, uh, just deeply sad for a couple of years. You know, we'd lost a, a very close family member, and um, I found within myself that when I was going into the woods, and the only place I felt calm and at ease with life was when I was by a river in a wood in the forest. You know, it, it, hearing the birds where you're lucky enough to be able to hear them. Um, and that idea that the sort of mental and physical health benefits that are so, they're absolutely scientifically proven. It's not just a sort of thing that we kind of fuzzy thing. Biophilic design and biophilia is literally the love of nature and the hu human needs to be connected to the natural world. And because that's where we're meant to be. That's where what our DNA is created and that's where we've evolved to be. Um, we're not designed to be in concrete jungles. Um, so yeah, we absolutely look to promote uh, the idea that um, urban spaces can be designed empathetically with nature in mind and, and if we did that much much more we'd see so much better mental and physical health benefits for the wider population people would recover faster from illness kids would concentrate better in the classroom we're more creative we're more productive we'd have a healthier population and that's got to be good for the economy as well and again another thing we talk about is making the commercial case for nature and you know it's not just as fuzzy nice to have from a kind of you know it's it's nice to have trees around it there's a really really strong and powerful commercial case and sadly money is the thing that makes things happen and people listen to and again from from a political perspective i wish government would get their heads around this idea that actually 
it's better for the economy to have a balanced relationship with the natural world rather than just smashing it, smashing it and building, building, building more things. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's something we're definitely keen to promote through planting. Well, we've got, I, I know there's, what, about 20 minutes left on this? I think. As long as you need, yeah. Well, as long as we need, but um, this was just an opportunity if anybody had any questions from the audience or anything that you're thinking, oh, I'd really love to know about one of the speakers or anything like that, if there is anything. Yeah. Wait, uh, do you want to go? I'll let her. She's, she's taller. She can make the stage jump easier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate everything you've all said. I, I find it inspirational. However, I feel that as everyone speaks, almost, a lot of the time anyway, it's still a case of humans being in charge. We need to get away from that. Nature can take care of itself without us. The planet can take care of itself without us. We've caused the damage, we make the plastic, we build the concrete, we're rooting up, we're knocking down trees, etc., etc. We are the harm, we are the disease. So I feel uncomfortable with the idea of what we should do to help nature, what we should create, blah, 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 to help us economically, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. Why can't we allow nature to be what it is, what it's programmed to be, what it's designed to be, and nothing to do with us? Just leave it, be itself. We're not, we're not in charge. We shouldn't have the arrogance of feeling we want to get back to nature, but we're still in charge of nature and everything else. And nature isn't a mess. Nature was described a few times as a mess. Yes, it's a beautiful mess, but it's not a mess where nature is concerned. Only people see it as a mess. I, I mean, I totally agree, um, like wholeheartedly, but annoyingly, the, the powers that be, and they are very powerful, seem so dead set on trying to destroy nature and so we kind of have to reach them on their terms a little bit which annoyingly is is money so kind of speak their language to to try and make the change I, I do think as the younger generations rise hopefully there will become a, a slight reframing of what success means so this like profit first madness will hopefully start to subside and it'll be reframed and it'll be like you know preserving nature is actually success and you know living a, a really fulfilled life with your loved ones rather than trying to get a brand spot like you know a new car and a massive house um, but no yeah I, I, I totally agree nature nature will do its own thing and, and it will carry on without us so fully agree and I agree with what you've just said Alex as well in that it's about valuing nature as well and I don't think any of us disagree with what you're saying and I think but you know ultimately you have to speak to the people in power in means and terms that they understand and I think we'd all love to see a world where well, nature was allowed to, to go free and, and be what it needs to be, but we also, there's, there's a balancing act between a kind of idealism which we would all love, but is it realistic and how do we make the incremental steps towards actually affecting positive change? Yeah, I, I often think about how we are, it's how sort of anthropocentric our view is. Like, I totally agree. It's, I'd love to just let let nature be. And I, I don't like this idea of like, we're the center of everything we need to, because even, yeah, even conservation, it, I agree, it's it's a, an element of control. It's, ma it's still managing, it's still trying to control in some way, even if it's for the good, you know. But it's, I guess it's just a product of the world we live in now. So few people would engage in a conversation or with conservation if, there wasn't an element of like, well, you, you will benefit from this, you know, and whether we like it or not, that's kind of how it is. But I also think, particularly among the younger generation, I've realised a lot of people are more, are very keen on this idea of rewilding, which I've mentioned a few times. You know, one of the core concepts in uh, of that is is letting, creating a space and letting nature take its course and that is becoming a more popular idea so maybe there is going to be a shift in how how we see our place in the world you know living alongside nature I, yeah i kind of look at it on like a on my personal journey like my first realization was actually from a very selfish one i was in ibiza and i thought 
this beach is lovely. There's quite a lot of plastic around. It'd be quite sad if I wasn't able to enjoy this going forward. So, like, my entry to it was, sadly, from a very selfish perspective. I think that's kind of the journey. That's kind of how we're conditioned is, you know, self first. And then my thinking actually went beyond that afterwards. Like, actually, no, it'd be a shame if other people couldn't enjoy this. And then, you know, I kind of went further down the journey that way. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I was very... Uh, if you'd have asked me a few years ago, you know, I would have said I prefer wildlife more than more than people. But the kind of the networks that I've formed over the last few years and realizing the value of of like coming together, working together, and having these communities when you're faced with such a huge challenge, you want to make a change, but you don't know where to start. There's value in that. So there is a ver there is a very human element, and there always will be. One of the one of the speakers on the panel here on uh, on Friday, I believe it was Gemma, Dr. Jer Gemma Jerome, who uh, is uh, the founder of something called Building in Nature, and and she highlighted the role actually, and this is going back quite a long way into history, but when humans started to organise around religion, and we actually started to separate ourselves from the natural world, like a lot of the more older religions uh, were based around worship of the sun, worship of nature, um, uh, wor worship of tangible things that were actually real. Um, I'm now far bit from me to say that other gods aren't real, but the or organized religion was the piece where we started to actually go, we are in some way better than nature and we're in some way different and we're separate from it and there's some you know really interesting work to, to look into on that front I learned a lot from Gemma Jerome and again I, if you're interested in designing cities and urban spaces that are um, absolutely respectful of the fact that we are just part of this huge jigsaw rather than the controllers of it and the puppets the gods um, then I, I would really recommend looking at Gemma's work um I think that you know humans and nature are intrinsically connected like humans are a part of nature so they shouldn't necessarily be separated it's more modern life is not connected with nature modern life is is where the issues are being caused and that we need to find a way to kind of you know go back to our roots as it were to to reconnect um, and you know, changing this discourse that people don't belong in nature, that's, that's not true, we, we do belong. And, but as you said, not at the center of it. It's, we're, we're a part of the bigger ecosystem and that's the way we need to think. We don't need to think we're at the top and we need to control how the rest of the ecosystem functions. We need to learn how to function within the ecosystem, but also within modern society as well. I think, I think it's one thing that we hate doing as humans, which admitting that maybe we were wrong. <laughs> and like, there was this amazing kind of like, you know, Garden of Eden paradise system that kind of existed and we've gone, nah, we'll try and make our own, but actually it's not really working. So we need to go, let's try and give that one a go again. It was actually pretty good. Yeah, I exactly agree, yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the audience had any sort of questions either about anything else. Ruby, you are welcome to come back up as you're well. <laughs> oh, wait, no, you're not. <laughs> um, so at some point, someone mentioned greenwashing. Um, it's a bit of a difficult one, but what are some tips um, for everyone here to tell apart companies that do greenwashing and companies that are actually genuinely green? Uh, there's some really good certifications out there. I've mentioned B Corp, which I think is uh, a really progressive certification. It's incredibly hard to, to achieve, to attain B Corp certification. It's something that Planted, we've been working on for about 18 months now, and it goes much deeper than just like your environmental impact, but it's about your societal impact, how you uh, treat your staff, how you your kind of um, top-to-toe assessment of the business and uh, and how you kind of respect the planet essentially and respect people and planet over over profit which is something Alex touched on quite rightly um, I think just just think think does this make sense you know does it make sense that uh, an oil company just because it's it's uh, corporate colors are all in green that it's it's a green company you know so many companies use use colors just to 
on people basically you know just because it says eco-conscious eco-friendly product ask what that actually means look at the ingredients look at where it's sourced look at where it's come from look at who's made it um, and then just look at the packaging as well we've looked at um, we work with a company called FlexiHex here who were one of the sponsors of the talks who've created this incredible packaging which is basically a replacement for um, bubble wrap it's a 100% recycled paper which is 100% compostable so, and it's reusable so you can either repackage what you've sent your package in or you can stick it in your compost bin and it goes into the soil like just be smart and ask questions and challenge and, and normally the answers are kind of there if you ask enough questions. Well, one other thing as well, I will get to that in a second, is also when you come to events like this and you do hear from people that are in sustainability that have now sort of started to dedicate their lives and their work towards it and you have other different partners at the things and you can read all the boards and you go visit and you talk to people and you learn what it is that makes a company more sustainable. Um, and not just like a greenwash company. So I know there's a question there. Really, really simple question. Um, what's next for each of you in your world of sustainability? Um, so I'm currently studying with Olivia a zoology degree. Uh, so hopefully learning about more about wildlife is the first step. Um, I also am working on an education project funded by Nat Geo uh, to, it's all about the weird wildlife of the UK, it's going to be a series of live streams that are streamed to primary school classrooms across the UK, um, happening in the next year or two, and so yeah, educating the next generation and enthusing them about the, the underappreciated, the, the unloved and the odd animals that can be found right right here, right on their doorsteps, is, is my next mission. And in terms of Reserver, uh, we are currently working to expand our first reserve, which is the world's first youth-funded nature reserve up in the Chaco Cloud Forest in Ecuador. Uh, we're expanding that to uh, protect an area that's currently threatened by gold mining. So. Um, so in terms of my work with UK Youth for Nature, um, we'll be launching some campaigns in relation to COP15. Um, so COP26 kind of brought the attention to many people in the UK about the, uh, the climate conference. But um, COP15 is the biodiversity conference and it's usually overshadowed by climate change even though it's still a um, an equally a serious issue, so um, I'll be working on, on helping with campaigns around providing education and kind of a bit of myth busting around these conferences um, and, and why we have them and, and what they're hoping to achieve. Um, and then for me personally, um, I'm currently interning as a research assistant um, looking at natural offsets. It's a really interesting area and an area in the UK that's only going to expand in the coming years. Um, so if, if like anyone's interested in, in talking about natural offsets here in the audience, I can literally talk about it for hours. So, so please do come and talk to me. Um, I think, yeah, directly after this, I'm going to go and find some MPs addresses and go and kick their doors in. Um, no, I think really just from my side, it's just kind of continuing to learn and carry on the discussion uh, on, on the platforms that I was sort of lucky to, to be given. Um, but I, I just have this belief that like all humans are intrinsically good and they kind of, they, deep down they know, like, you know, these, these big corporate bosses, deep down, you know, they didn't start out evil. I think it's all about trying to keep this conversation going and, and pull the veil back so that these people realize and, and make the right decisions. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of carrying on learning and, and, and carrying on the conversation really. I was going to mention Jacob Rees-Mogg when you said that, but I'm, I, I won't, I definitely won't, um, that would be wrong. From Planted's perspective, uh, we're going to keep telling the story, we're going to keep um, trying to educate and inspire people through um, events such as these, bringing amazing people who've been on this panel together, uh, amazing companies like um, Enki and Bax Botanicals and Goldfinger who made this table another country who I mentioned before out of the valley um, soul cell who've managed to power power this um, event through solar energy so it's an off-grid event um, Dura ocean plastic these chairs we're sitting on are made out of 100% recycled waste plastic from the sea and also we'll probably be going out for a fundraising a crowdfunding funding um, to, to 
raise more uh, investment to try and grow these events and take them out around the country. We're running an event at um, Stourhead in association with the National Trust, which is on the Somerset Wiltshire border, which I'd love you all to come to and also join our planted community at www.planted-community.co.uk. But we're going to keep, keep telling the story, keep running events and keep building our media profile. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we've just gone over sort of what we said we'd do. And we have, as we're talking about sustainability, we have a cleanup that we're doing along Regent's Canal. And it's actually with Tommy from Bamboo Brush. He's in the audience. He can give a wave. There you go. Um, so we're going to go do that. If, if, unless there's any other questions for anybody before we go? No? Well, there you go. So we'd just like to extend our thanks, obviously, to all the panelists and obviously to you guys too. It's amazing that you come out here and you're willing to listen and learn and hopefully it's been thought provoking and you go home and you think, yeah, you know what, I can. I'm gonna build my, my balcony and fill it with all these beautiful flowers. So that's what we hope you guys take away from this and obviously maybe also if, you bring, if you've brought wellies uh, or any other shoes that you're happy to go get a bit mucky and down on the Thames, we've got all the kit to go clean up. Um, and yeah, we'll be meeting here in so 10 minutes we're, we're going to change shoes white shoes don't do so well um but yeah we just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for being here but especially for sam and deb at planted for this incredible event space and for giving us all the opportunities to talk about what we're really really passionate about and then obviously thank you to tommy who's going to be helping us with this event uh, with the cleanup he's supplied us with all the litter pickers and just really extending all of our heartfelt thanks to all of you on the panel and for everyone in the audience today for just contributing to the change that we're going to see in this world because it's really important. So thank you so much.